Okay, welcome to Computer Networks. This is lecture eight. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about homework four, which is due this week. And I also want to point out that at least uh, there's one question from homework five that's already posted. That's the only part that will require, if you want to call it programming, that is, that is what it is. Uh, well, it's just a few lines of code. The rest of the assignment, homework five, will be will require maybe some processing the numbers in Excel, like if you want to use Perl, and some simple calculations. And this uh, homework is really designed, the rest of the homework five will be designed as exam review. So please uh, take a look at it when you get a chance. We're going to talk about homework four in a little bit, but before that, I just wanted to remind people who are uh, not here, uh, as well as who are here, that I'm looking for students to lead the discussions on these uh, in-class uh, student presentation topics because no one signed up for it. Uh, I'm going to open it to anyone who is interested because I had or earlier said that only students who have not participated actively in the class are eligible to lead these discussions, but no one has signed up for it, so anyone can lead. If you want to lead some of these discussions, the topics that are already posted, <coughs> on the lecture slides from last lecture, as well as on discussion board, please reply to that thread. And uh, tell me which, which topic you'd like to lead the discussion on. And leave the discussion first on the discussion board, and then we're going to summarize those discussions in the class using a five-minute uh, presentation. There were no TA office hours last week, so we've extended the office hours by one hour on Tuesday and Thursday. This week. Today we're going to spend at least a few minutes talking about homework four um, because there, there are some uh, concerns, there are some, uh, some non-obvious things that might make it really easy for you to debug the program. So we're going to talk about that and we're going to just continue our discussion of transport protocols. So let me just, uh, just say a few things about homework four and uh, happy to take questions and discuss them further. <coughs> As you recall, homework four is about making the HTTP server that we developed in the previous assignment able to accept multiple connections at a time. When we do that, uh, the, the reason we want to do that is because we don't have, want to have to launch multiple servers to serve multiple clients. And the way the web servers are uh, built and deployed, they're designed to serve many, many requests using a single server. So we kind of want to get in that direction. But one important thing to keep in mind when we're designing such a system is we want to limit the level of concurrency. For example, a single server should not respond, should not serve the requests from too many clients because we might run out of buffers, uh, there might be CPU bottleneck, various things. So we want to limit the number of clients we want to serve. And this homework allows you to explore how to do that. That's the idea. We said in the homework description that you have to keep track of unique IPs and clients because the homework says that each client should not be allowed to open more than a certain number of connections. So you need to come up with a way to determine what is unique, what is a, what is a unique application. And the answer is not very straightforward there. You probably realize that if you started working on it. It's more straightforward how to track unique IPs. That's, that's pretty uh, straightforward. When you accept a connection, you know what, what is the IP, right? Um, and it's easy to test your server if you have a client that takes a long time to finish its request. And one way to do that is by using the HTTP client that you that you wrote in homework two, or you could use something called wget. That's that's a command that's available in Bayou, and if you use that flag limit rate uh, to let's say ten bytes per second or something like that, then that allows you to test multiple con multiple clients that are trying to act connect to the server and sending the HTTP request and getting the response concurrently. So here is one testing scenario uh, that you might be able to set up on Bio. You start your server, and you launch multiple instances of wget 
with a small rate limit using certain URL that your server provides, then because this client will download the data, whatever the server is sending at a lower rate, all of these clients will be active. So what you can do is from a command line, you launch one wget with an ampersand at the end. Do you guys know what that does? If you put an ampersand at the end of the command, you come back to the shell, right? When the program is still active. And then you launch another wget. It doesn't terminate immediately because it takes a while, right? And you launch another wget, you launch another wget. This is how you have concurrent clients. And what should happen eventually is after you've launched a certain number of wgets, uh, it should no longer be able to establish a connection with the server. So this is, this is one way in which you might be able to test. A good way to automate that might be to put all these commands in a shell script. You can just say in a wget, in whatever command you have, and then put an ampersand at the end, and then say sleep in a one second if you want that in the next line. And then the following line, you'll have another wget, and then sleep. Then you'll have another wget. And let's say you've allowed for up to five concurrent connections. Then the first five wgets should be able to download those files just fine if you look at the output file. And the sixth one should not be able to. This, this is how you can test if the server is really working. Or server is limiting the level of concurrency. Does that, does that make sense to everyone? This is, I think this is the easiest way to test your just a program. Any question about that? And any, any other uh, discussions or concerns you might have? So yeah. The server side, do you want us for each connection? Do you want us to establish a new process or a new thread? It's entirely up to you. It it has to be in C, and it has to compile without installing external libraries. So that probably severely limits the number of options you have. But within those constraints, you are free to yes. use whatever mechanism you want. Yeah, that's fine. So, but the, I was wondering about threads. Does yeah. you, you, you could use select, thread? for example, if you want. Yeah. You could manage all the connections within one process, if you want. But that's a little bit more complicated. Yeah. Has, has anyone tried that? Yeah. yeah, but that's kind of a little bit more complicated. <laughs> yeah, I think fork is the easiest if you if you want to go that route, and and it's probably not going to be the most efficient. But we're not. That's not what we're looking for. We're looking for a way to control concurrency. Any other questions, concerns? So if you have a fork. Here's one interesting uh, topic that you'll have to uh, determine how to tackle. So at the time of forking, you know, so first of all, you have to keep track of how many unique IPs have connected so far, right? What, what, how many uh, active connections are there from, from an IP? Now you have to keep track of if you're forking, you need to keep track of which processes have terminated so that you can allocate one more uh, connection for that particular IP. Does everyone understand that? Let's say we've allowed up to a maximum of five connections from a single IP. And let's say we've received five requests. And let's say the first request uh, has been completed. We've sent our response. We've closed the connection. Now, you need to know that the connection termination has happened so that we can accept one new connection from that particular IP. How do you plan to do that? You need to keep track of uh, what are the new connections being opened from that particular IP, and then when the connection is terminated, you need to, you need to keep track of that. How would you do that? You use a struct. Well, you use what? You use a struct. You just create a data structure. Some but how do you track. communicate if you're doing fork? How do you communicate between a child and a parent process? Oh, you know what fork returns. Mm -hmm. so, so you plan to look at the return value yeah. of fork. But so when was that, that, that returns uh, process ID? Yeah, but you know when the child terminates. It returns status. Yeah. Yeah. So, for example, with fork, you're going to create two different processes, right? We call one of them child, call the other one parent. Now, let's say a child was handling a connection from IP address A, right? 
let's say the child is done sending the request for that and the connection has been terminated. So how does the parent know that this has happened? Is it two completely different processes at this point? I'm sure there is a way. <laughs> there is a way to send the message from one process to another. Exactly. So that's kind of the idea. So in, in Unix, there are many ways. Yeah, in Unix, there are many ways uh, to send a message from one process to another. And that's kind of the hint. For example, uh, do you know how to send a message from, from an HTTP client to HTTP server? You know how to do that, right? These are two completely different processes, but they're able to communicate. So that would be one way, if you want to use sockets or something like that. Did everyone uh, get what we just discussed? So that will be a problem that you will run into if you use fork. Because when you fork, you create completely different processes. And when one of the processes completes the HTTP request, you need to tell the listening process that, OK, you know, we're allowed to accept one more connection from IP address A. So there has to be a way for these two processes to communicate and uh, allocate that slot. How about, a, how about a unique client? What's the difference between a unique IP and a unique client? Like the header. There's a name for that header field. Um, user, yeah. user, user agent, agent. yeah. Is, is it foolproof? Probably not. You can put whatever you want as a client, right? But, uh, <coughs> but that, that might be a reasonable way to look at it, at least for now, uh, with the understanding that it's not foolproof. I and mean, that's, uh, that's part of we know what we learn, right? <laughs> so do people understand the difference between a unique client and a unique IP? <coughs> yeah, OK. Now, some of you might not have the best HTTP server code, the most robust, or uh, maybe it doesn't work in all the cases. If that's the case, uh, I plan to make at least one solution as a standard solution so that uh, not having a good SW3 is, is not a bottleneck for you. I think there's at least one student who's interested. So if you're interested in getting a standard homework three solution, please get in touch with me rather than your fellow students. OK? Because I, I will distribute homework three that works. But if your homework three already works, it's a good idea to continue working on that because you're familiar with that code, right? Any other questions, discussions, concerns, testing strategies? But I, I told you, for example, how are we going to grade, right? We'll just put all these wget commands in a, in a shell script, and we'll just do sleep one, sleep one, sleep one, and then at some point, uh, one of those um, wgets should fail because of the limited concurrency, yes? Is there any way we could get the, like, for homework three, I think mine's working OK, but I'm curious to see how you would have done it. So can we? Uh, yeah, we can, we can actually make one of the student code available. Yeah, that's fine. So we'll, we'll make it available publicly, but if you want to use it, you better let me know. We'll just post a link, how about that, to the Targo. Any other? So who is almost done? OK. OK. Well, there is not much to do. Yeah, homework four is supposed to be a simple add-on to homework three. So once you start working on it, you realize it's actually not a lot of work. Anything else about the homework? I think homework two and three probably come closest to, you know, if you want to call it software engineering, which is writing potentially you know, more than 100 lines of code. Uh, hopefully, we'll never have to do that later in the course, at least you know, per week. Anyone curious at homework five? Who, who got a chance to look at it? No? OK. Well, how about you <coughs> at least uh, read it, and uh, we can maybe spend five minutes again next, next lecture talking <coughs> about it. I, I know you don't have time to work on it right now, because uh, you should work on homework four, but why don't you at least uh, uh, read homework five? 
and then we can talk about it so that I can give you some hints. Oh, actually, yeah, I read it. Oh, you read it? Okay. Yeah, just, there was something about getting a statistical point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So how about, uh, so that we can have a more uh, fruitful discussion. that will benefit everyone. So how about everyone re read homework five, okay? All right, Any, anything else uh, that we should discuss before we get into the, get into our discussion of transport layer? All right, maybe we should close the door. <laughs> okay, the last few lectures we've been talking about transport layer, and as we said, this is a set of functionality that builds on the network layer functionality, which we haven't talked about <laughs> in this class. But what we've talked about are application layer protocols that rely on transport protocols for reliable message delivery. For example, when an HTTP client sends a message to the server, we want that message to be delivered reliably to the server. And when the server responds, we want, we want that message to be delivered reliably. And we've been focusing our discussion on a transfer protocol called TCP, which provides reliable delivery, as well as a few additional features that uh, we're going to talk about today. But before we get there, let's just recap how a TCP connection is established. We talked about a three-way handshake between a client and a server. <coughs> client sends a SYN, server sends a SYNAC, and client acknowledges that SYNAC. Right? So this is the basic three-way handshake. One of the interesting consequences of this type of handshaking in TCP is it's incredibly easy to launch a scene, something called scene flood attack. Let's think about the server. The server sends a scene act with, a, with its sequence number Y and the server does not know that the connection has been established until it receives an act. Is that correct? Does that make sense? Because uh, the client has to acknowledge that, okay, it receives it received that SYNAC. What that suggests is the server has to keep something in memory. For example, which ACK it's anticipating, right? So there is a little bit of memory that the server has to allocate for each connection in progress. Connection that has not been established yet, but a connection that hopefully will be established. What happens if a client sends a lot of sins but never acts? What happens on the server side in that case? The server is going to first send in a bunch of sin acts, right? Because that's what you do. If you receive a sin, you reply using a sin act. But when it sends a sin act, it's also sending its sequence number, so it needs to remember what sequence number it sent at the minimum. It needs to remember that uh, there, is a, uh, there is a connection in progress. It is going to be established soon, and it's going to wait until act. So the server might use a lot of resources. If there's a flood of sins coming in, it might end up using a lot of memory, for example. And what's the problem with that? What's the problem? It gets overloaded. It gets overloaded. And what's the problem with getting overloaded? Yeah, so when a legitimate client might need to establish a connection to the server, the server might have no more resources to allocate a new sequence number to keep that in memory, waiting for an act. So that's called sin flood. You just send a lot of sins, and you don't respond. And that causes some type of denial of service. Another interesting thing you can do with the sin synax sequence is have you guys used something called ping? What do you use ping for? Send packets, get the IP address. Yes, you get the IP address, but uh, you can do much more. Even the standard use of ping. What information does it display on the screen when you say ping something? 
First of all, displays IP address. You're right. What else? Yeah, how much time it took. How, how much time it took? So it, yeah, exactly. Packet loss. Packet loss, yeah, exactly. So let's think about how much time it took. So some internet hosts, they don't support that protocol. And if they don't support that protocol, ping cannot print how much time it took. Because being to be able to print how much time it took, you are relying on the system to respond with some type of message, right? And this is mostly a diagnostic message. Not all the hosts are going to support whatever ping uses in ICMP protocol, actually. Can you solve that problem using TCP, SYN, and SYNX? Let's say you want to know well, what is the how long it takes for a message to get to a server that does not respond to ping. How would you use TCP in that case? You send a SYN, and you get a SYNAC. And you basically find out how long it took. So this would be another way to finding what the round trip time is. Does that make sense? So if we have a web server, it's not necessary that uh, we support ICMP protocol. But hopefully we support TCP because that's how all the requests are coming in for HTTP, right? So you can find out what the RTT is using SYN and SYNX. All right, so enough about uh, establishing a connection. And these are the function calls that you might use to establish a connection. Now let's think about connection termination. So we talked about a message called fin. It's a flag in the header. We said that particular field, and you get an ACK. Why are there two sets of fins? And we said last time that each side has to close the socket when we were talking about the application layer protocol, right? And um, what happens if one side does fin act and the other side does not send a fin? What happens in that case? One side gets closed, the other stays open. Yeah. But uh, what can you do with that kind of connection? The side that never closed keeps sending data. Exactly. The semantics is the stack will keep on sending data until you call the close. All right. But the connection is a lot simpler than establishing the, or termination is simpler than establishing the connection. Now, we also looked at the state diagrams, and do you have any questions about them? This basically shows what are the different possible ways in which you might establish a connection. And the reason why there are a lot of branches is because the two sides sending SINs, for example, it could happen in different sequences because there are two different nodes. And same for um, terminating the connection, because one side might send fin first versus the other side. And that's the reason why there are a lot of branches. Can you tell me why we need time wait? Why do we need time wait? Just to make sure and we catch any packets that were sent uh, before but have been delayed. And so we end up receiving them after the fin. So just to make sure that we receive all the packets that we need to receive for that particular connection before we potentially reuse the um, use the connection, for example, on the same port. We talked about EWMA. Um, you will you learn more about this in the homework. But the idea is, rather than give the same weight to all the samples, if we have a reason to believe that recent past to some, somehow better indicates what the near future will be, then it makes sense to give more weight when you're computing these averages to, to the recent past. That's the high level idea. And if you use that formula iteratively, that is how the weights work out. You're giving higher weight to the 
samples from the recent past and lower weight to the samples from the distant past. This, this will be much more concrete when you do the homework. Okay, so now getting into the new topic related to TCP, one of the things that we need to do for the transport to work correctly and efficiently is we need to be able to control how much data we want to send it to the send to the network. Why do we worry about that? Why do we want to control the amount of data we want to uh, we want to send to the network? Any guesses? Why not just send as much as possible? It's a limited resource. It's a limited resource. Any other perspective on that? I think that covers almost everything. Any any elaboration? The other end may not be able to handle. Yeah, the, the that we can receive. Yeah, the other. Yeah, exactly. So that's you know part of limited resource, right? For example, limited resource could be the receiver side. The receiver side has a slower CPU or has limited memory. What else? could be included in this argument that the resource is limited. It could be the network. It might be sharing that network with many other users. So one idea that helps the transfer protocols to send the right amount of data is called flow control. So that's, that's the first idea we're going to explore. So the basic question is, now, how much data should the transfer protocol send? How much data should TCP send at a time or at a given time? And when to send it? How to time these transmissions? Turns out that's another consideration. Flow control has been part of TCP specification almost you know, from the beginning. And the goal is to send just the right amount of data. We don't want to send too much data because that could cause problems in the network and we're going to we're going to explore you know, what, what those problems are. And it basically uses a sliding window protocol that we covered, I think, about two or three lectures ago. There's a notion of a receiver window that tells the sender the amount of data it is willing and able to accept. And the sender sends exactly that amount of data. That's the basic idea. I'll expect you to be able to do simple computation uh, based on to computing, for example, various windows and what's, you know, what is the maximum amount of data you should send, uh, so on and so forth. So if we look at this diagram here, on the receiver side first, because it's the receiver that advertises how much data it is able to accept, right? So a receiver usually has a certain amount of buffer allocated for receiving the packets. That's called maximum receive buffer. That's the absolute maximum that it can receive. But it can't re but it, it, it is not able to receive that whole amount at a given time, and that's because there might already be some packets that have been received, but have not been dispatched to the applications yet. So we can't really receive maximum receive buffer all the time. So that last byte read basically tells the receiver where the read pointer is coming from the application. For example, I'll give you an example now, um, going back to our HTTP client and HTTP server. So the TCP stack is receiving, let's say we're talking about the client. It's receiving a bunch of uh, data from the server. But our HTTP client has not necessarily read all of the data that TCP has received. It has read only up to a certain point. So that is last byte read. Next byte expected is something that TCP has computed based on the sequence numbers that were received. For example, if the last sequence number that, that was received from the server was T, then TCP knows that the next one should be T plus 1. Right? 
and the sequence number that are being read by the client, that's completely different. Does that make sense? So what's the difference between these two sequence numbers? The sequence number read by the client, let's say it's K, and the next sequence number or next sequence number to be received. What's the difference? The difference is basically the packets that are still in the receive buffer but have not been sent to the client yet. Right, that's the amount of packets. So that's the shaded area. So we have the total buffer size minus the shaded area. So that is the number of bytes we can receive in the next transmission from the sender. Just to summarize this, let's say the whole area is maximum receive buffer. We've received a bunch of packets in the meantime, but we have not had a chance to send it to the application or the application hasn't had a chance to read it. That's the shaded part. So we can only receive the light part of the buffer. What happens if the sender sends more data than that? We don't have room, right? We just have to drop it. We don't have room. So flow control is dictated by the window advertised by the receiver. If the receiver send, tells the sender how much data it is able to accept at a given time. So it's doing these calculations and every time it sends a message back to the sender, it's going to say, at the moment, this is the number of bytes I can receive. To simplify the discussion, I said sequence number, but it's actually the byte sequence number. It's not the packet sequence number. How about on the sender side? Let's look at the windows on the sender side. On the sender side, let's uh, think about HTTP server again. Client sent us a request, and we need to write the content of a file, whatever the file was, onto the TCP socket. Right? So our application, which is HTTP server, is writing the content of the file onto this special file. We call it socket. So let's say our file is 100 bytes long. We might read from that file one byte at a time, and we might write byte number 50, byte number 51, byte number 52, etc. But just because byte number 50 has been written to the TCP socket does not mean byte number 50 has also gone out to the network. right? Maybe it's only byte number 20 at the moment, because there could be some lag between the time our HTTP server writes to the socket and the byte starts going out into the network. So those are the two quantities, last byte written and last byte sent. How about last byte act? So let's say our HTTP server has written the 50th byte onto the socket, but only the 20th byte has gone out. How about last byte act? Maybe the receiver has only act maybe 10th byte, even earlier. Right? So what should be the relation between these three numbers that we talked about and the receiver window? Let's look at this relation here on the same line as the sender. It says that last byte sent, okay, this is the byte that we already sent, minus last byte act. So we've sent sequence number 20. Again, just to simplify, I'm going to use sequence. <coughs> we've sent sequence number 20, and we've received an acknowledgment for you know, tenth sequence number. So that means what's happening with this 10 packets. It's either in the network or for some reason we haven't received an acknowledgement, right? And let's say we know that the receiver has indicated that uh, it's willing to receive 10 packets. Then should we send more packets or no? Why not? Because the receiver just has to collect Yeah. Exactly, because the receiver has indicated that it's able to receive 10 packets at a time, just to simplify the discussion. We've already sent 20th byte, and we haven't received an acknowledgment for anything after 10th byte. That means, potentially, the receiver buffer is full right now. Okay, so that's the relation. 
Now let's think about a few scenarios uh, that complicates this picture. First of all, sometimes the advertise window can fall to zero. Can you tell me why that could be the case? The receiver has all the info in their buffer, and whatever application yeah. is asking for that data isn't actually grabbing anything from the buffer. Yeah. So in which case, the receiver shouldn't say, I can receive more packets, right? The receiver can only receive zero at that point. What happens on the sender side in that case? Well, once the receiver says, I can only receive, I can receive no more than zero, the sender better stop sending the data. What happens to the application on the sender side? It blocks. It can't write anymore. Now, here's an interesting uh, situation. In TCP, these windows are sent in the header, right? Because a window is one of the fields in the header. And you send TCP segments either as data when you have useful data to send or when you send an ACK, right? So should the sender completely stop or what should the sender do in that case if the, if the receiver had for some reason said advertise window of zero? It makes sense to send a small amount of data, the minimal amount of data, to try to break this deadlock. And that's, that's what that line is talking about. OK, let's think about this particular scenario. Let's say we have 50 students. They all have SSH window open on Bayou and are typing one character per second. So when you're using SSH, every time you type a character, what do you expect to happen? It better get to buy you, right? Even with one character, it better get to buy you. So how many packets are being read and written by Bayou per second? Let's just think about the read. So how many packets does Bayou need to process? How many incoming packets? 50 packets, right? And to ensure that the message was delivered reliably, it needs to send an ACK. And so that's 50 more packets. So that's 100 packets. And it turns out, because of the way we've designed the link layer technologies, there is a minimum frame size, usually 64 bytes. So how much data actually are we transferring in the network? Even for this very simple application, we're just uh, the useful data is basically one byte per second per student. So we're talking about useful data of 50 bytes per second. Right? Can you can you do a calculation? Is the minimum frame size so 64 times 100? Yes. So hopefully this gives you a feel for what is wrong with the very simple TCP algorithm that we talked about. Right? We're, we're, there's an enormous amount of overhead. The question is, how do we solve this problem? Any ideas? This is a huge overhead. First of all, we appreciate that, right? Because the useful data is one byte, but we're having to send 64 bytes in one direction. Then you need an ACK. That's another 64 bytes. How do we solve this problem? We can buffer things up and jam them into one frame, like wait until yeah. So here's a problem with that. So let's say I'm using my laptop to connect to my bio, right? But there is nothing to buffer. I'm just typing one character per second. So you're saying I should be willing to uh, wait for 10 seconds for the character to show up? Do you understand the problem yes. or potential concern with the solution that he proposed? That, that's, I think that's the right direction. You, know, you somehow buffer things. 
that's that gets us uh, to this topic. Um, that gives an algorithm, basically, on how to solve at least a problem of this nature, not exactly the problem that we talked about. It's called Nagel's algorithm. Have you heard of it before? Who, who of you is a gamer? Plays uh, online games, high performance. Did you tweak TCP on your machine? Say what? Did you tweak TCP on your machine? No, I didn't. Okay. Then you're not a hardcore gamer. <laughs> so if you go to Google and search for, uh, you know, how to increase the performance of your TCP, especially in the context of gaming, um, you'll, you'll hear a lot of people talking about how to disable Nagel's algorithm. Basically, the idea is, as someone suggested here, um, you do some type of buffering, right? And the reason you want to do that is you don't want to pay the overhead of this huge headers even when you have a small amount of data to send. Let's look at the algorithm. So at any given time, if there is enough data to send to fill a complete packet, MSS stands for maximum segment, segment size, you just send the packet. Because that's the best you could do anyway, right? Now, if there is an unacknowledged data in flight, then you actually buffer the packet. Why is that? Why do you want to do that? still hasn't processed the data you already sent to him. So basically, your character that you're talking about or whatever, still, you haven't received information about it anyway, so you might as well buffer up whatever you're doing. Yeah, that, that's, that's sort have, of the... You have to wait for the act anyway. Before yeah, you send it. yeah that, that's sort of the motivation. If you haven't received an act, what that means is uh, the server probably has not processed the previous character that you sent. And if it hasn't done that, you might as well wait a little bit Okay, so that's the first. But you know, why do you, why is waiting useful? You you might be able to collect a few other data pack, a uh, few other um, application level data, group them into a single segment, and send it to the server. So there is a potential for saving, and that's the reason you buffer it. Does that make sense? And if there is no unacknowledged data in flight, you just uh, send the new data. Why is that? <coughs> well, there is always point waiting. You might always have more data to send. It might delay the response time. So it's a trade-off between how much and under what conditions are you willing to wait. So basically that's the delay and the efficiency. How much are you willing to wait to increase the efficiency? What's the most efficient system in this case? Let's say your goal is to make it as efficient as possible. What would you do to TCP? Buffer as much as possible, right? But that has some consequences. The delay might go up. And in the end, it might not be very efficient. Because once the delay goes up, you're probably not using the network effectively. <coughs> If you're more interested in this topic, uh, you could go look at that link. Unfortunately, it turns out the textbook does not cover this algorithm, even though I think it's, a, it's an interesting twist to standard TCP algorithm and really helps us understand how TCP works. Here's another idea that we're almost uh, simultaneously developed. <coughs> it's called delayed acknowledgment. So in TCP, to ensure that the message that we wanted to send from the sender to the receiver has indeed gotten there reliably, the receiver sends an ACK back to the sender. Because that's the only way the sender knows that the receiver actually received the data. One of the ways to make the ACKing process more efficient is to collect a bunch of acts and send that in one packet. Rather than send one act per packet that was received, you wait for, let's say, you know, five successful receptions, 
and then you send one act saying, okay, I received all those five packets. So that's the idea behind delayed act. What's the problem with uh, this particular algorithm? The sender might not know for a while if the packet was indeed received correctly and reliably at the receiver. And the sender might, for example, do what? It might retransmit. So you have to be careful about how much you want to delay the acknowledgments. If the delay is too short, what is the problem? Yeah, you're not very efficient, right? Let's say each packet is arriving every 100 milliseconds and your delay is 50 milliseconds. Are you able to delay the acknowledgments? Yes, you're able to delay the acknowledgments, but you didn't accomplish any improvement in efficiency. That's actually really bad. You just uh, made the delay worse without increasing any, any, any efficiency. What if you're receiving packets every 100 milliseconds and you're willing to delay the acts by 200 milliseconds? What could you do in that case? About three acts Yeah. So if you receive a number of data packets within that delay time, you can just send uh, two or three or however many packets that you receive at a, at a given time. The way TCP acts work is you act a sequence number. So let's say you received five packets with byte sequences, you know, let's say 5, 10, 15, 20. It's adequate for you to act sequence number 20, and that would indicate that all of the previous bytes have been uh, received properly. So you're not even sending in a multiple, you're not even combining multiple ACK packets into a single ACK packet. You just uh, ACK the largest sequence number that you received, and that serves as multiple ACK. Now there is a problem with delayed acknowledgments, especially if you use it along with Nagel's algorithm. Let's think about that. So what does Nagel's algorithm try to do? Let's think about the sender side. What, what's the high level idea of Nagel's algorithm that we talked about? Try to buffer the packets uh, to look for an opportunity to combine multiple data items into a single packet, right? So you're trying to introduce some weight at the sender side. What is delayed act trying to do? It's trying to combine multiple acts into this into a single act on the receiver side. What happens if you use both of them at the same time? So the sender side is trying to wait as much as possible. And what is the receiver side trying to do? So what what's the problem? Yeah, they, they might wait for each other. Of course there are timeouts and other mechanisms, but uh, the delays could be large. Again, uh, I don't think the textbook talks about this, but uh, I encourage you to go look at that link. And this link down here is actually pretty interesting. Uh, you should go look at it. S someone who claims to be John Nagel posted that comment. Uh, it's it's hard to verify the identity <laughs> of the person, but uh, but you know things make sense. I read that comment. I want you to go look at that, and that uh, post also describes these two issues um, actually quite clearly. I, I enjoyed reading that post. I think you will enjoy it too. So here is here's just a quote from the Wikipedia page for Nagel's algorithm. In general, since Nagel's algorithm is only a defense against careless applications, it will not benefit a carefully written application that takes proper care of buffering the algorithm Buffering. The algorithm has either no effect or negative effect 
on the application. So let's try to parse this. Let's try to understand what uh, they're talking about. This is a quote uh, I lifted from that page. So what is a careless application? An application that just dumps data in. Yeah, so that could be one example of a careless application. Right. Now, if you have a careless application, what does Nagel's algorithm do? It's going to buffer things and it could potentially make things worse. Right? So, what's a careful application? A, care a careful application in this context would be an application that understands how uh, TCP times the transmissions and does the right thing. And it turns out there is you know, one particular sequence in which this can be really bad. Let's think about the following message exchange between the client and the server. So you have a write and then a write followed by a read. Okay. So the client wants to send two packets or two pieces of data. You send one piece of data and you send another piece of data. And in response to the second piece of data, let's say the server is supposed to respond with a packet and you're supposed to read it. What could happen is your application says, okay, socket write, you know, for the first piece of data. Socket write the second piece of data. And let's say the combination is larger than one in an MSS then you actually get the first piece of data shipped to the network to the server, right? So now your application needs to read some response from the server. Is that, so that's, that's our scenario, right? But when does the server receive the second part of the data? Because when we were writing an application, this application is uh, send to the server in a URL, send to the server data rate, read, in a file. Let's say that's the application. So server read you know, the URL. Server got that. But the server did not receive you know, the data rate or whatever. Why did the server not receive the data rate? It's not large enough. It's being buffered. And it's waiting for some acknowledgement after it receives the entire data. Exactly. You might be doing some kind of delayed act or something like that, the server. Okay. Right? Now, did the, does the server start uh, sending the data back to the client? No, because it hasn't received the second piece of data. And the client is waiting for data to come back from the server. And what is the server waiting for? Yeah. The data to come from the client. So how could you solve this problem? So that's, that's one example of careless application. So how would you write this application carefully? So it's time limit for waiting. You could do a time limit for waiting, and there already are various types of time limits for waiting. But could you do something even more careful? You could turn off Nagel. <laughs> yeah, you could turn off Nagel, that's right. <laughs> that's too, too far forward. Yeah, you, you could do that. Or you could also do the buffer flushes. If, if there is a way for you to tell the TCP saying, OK, I want this data sent now, and it probably makes sense for this particular application client to say, after the second write, I definitely want all the preceding writes to be sent to the server, even if the packet is not full. So that would be an example of a very careful application. Again, you know, we don't think about uh, all these issues when you're writing network applications, but you might have to when you, when, you, when you need to debug for performance. Which level is this TCP programming is done? Oh, so you, you, could get, you could have different APIs provided by the system that you can call just to say. The way it was so far only work with HTTP. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, I'll give you two examples. Uh, one on, let's say, Windows, Microsoft Windows. You can disable or enable these algorithms by reading and writing to the registry. So that's the level of programming we're talking about, some kind of system interface. In, in Unix, you, know, you might be able to write to a special file that configures TCP. And you, could, you can do that on the fly, actually. Have you used proc file system before? Have you heard of it? 
Which is taking operating system class? <laughs> taking right now, okay. So maybe they'll talk about you know proc file system. That's a Linux thing. Basically, there are ways to configure TCP um, to you know, enable or disable this particular algorithm if you want. Also, various timeouts and you know, what kind of timeout you want and, and things like that. Any questions before before we move on? I'll give you one more minute to think about the questions while we summarize flow control. By looking at its limitation, as we said, in flow control, it's usually the receiver that tells the sender how much data it is able to accept at a given time, and that is an implicit, that puts an implicit constraint on the sender. Even though it's able to send a lot more, it should not, and it does not. And that's how you control the amount of information going into the network, eventually to the receiver. That's the idea behind flow control. If you think about this, we've completely ignored the network resources. We've only been concerned about the buffer at the receiver. You know, one set of resource is the end host, the sender and the receiver. That's what we talked about until now, right? But another set of resource, perhaps even more important for some parties is the network because the network also has its own set of limitations about how much how, how many bits it can move you know from one place to another at a given time right so does the flow control that we talked about handle or is it even aware of network resources it's not we clearly advertise the window that prevents the sender from overrunning the buffers at the receiver. That's the primary purpose. Right? Let's say the network um, is severely congested. It's not able to move any bits at all, or very few. What does the receiver advertise as the window? Just in a standard flow control we talked about. Same thing. It might be generally large. Right, because it's not, it's not change based on that, the network congestion. Exactly, it it won't change based on the network condition. But if you look at, uh, let's say overall, you know what sizes of windows are being advertised, it's going to be on the large side, because it has lots of available buffer space. And is that good or bad? Bad, it's not accurate. Yeah, it's not that accurate, and the network is already congested. And if the if the sender somehow receives these large window advertisements, the sender is going to send even more packets. It's going to make things worse, right? So clearly, we need something more than flow control that we talked about. And that's called congestion control. So before we get there, I'll put this slide up here and give you a chance to ask any questions you might have about flow control. So do we understand the delayed acts and Nagel's algorithm and why gamers uh, hate Nagel's algorithm? For, for example, when you're gaming, or when you're playing games, <laughs> what kind of, uh, how much data do you think you're sending to the server? Are you generating a huge amount of data sending it to the server or small amount? Depends on the game, of course. But usually it's not a huge amount of data that you're sending to the server. You might just say, I'm going to move to the left one step. I'm generalizing you know, what online games are to some extent. But you know, there are a lot of games where you're sending that kind of information, right? Okay, I'm going to move to the left. And how many bytes of information is that? It's not a lot. And if, what if TCP buffers that? Then the other guy is going to kill you. <laughs> because you didn't move to the left, right? <laughs> And there could be similar problems with delayed acts as well. So the server probably should uh, act as soon as possible in this, in this particular scenario. Okay, so let's take a couple minutes break, and then uh, we'll uh, start our discussion on congestion control. One thing I forgot to tell you guys, maybe you guys already know this, is, um, 
the chances of you actually watching the lecture video online is really low if you don't actually come here. So, it's, so even though the videos are available online, uh, at least for me, the way it worked out was uh, I really got a lot from the lectures. Just going to be you're forced to go there, you know, you sit through it for an hour, two hours, even though you're falling asleep, whatever. You still get a lot more from the videos because, you know, when you're watching the videos, I don't know if anyone's going to watch the videos, you know. <laughs> uh, which time? Which the, because that last week I didn't come, so I wish both lectures. Yeah. No. Uh, and actually, the problem, the problem is, like, on the video, you only see the... Yeah. The if, you had, if you had yourself talking on the video, that yeah, would be more like a thing, because you actually have a person there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you kind of start falling asleep. You, like, out tap to, like, browse and... It's very interesting, right? It's like, oh, yeah, it's, really, it's, hard, it's hard to pay attention when you just have a slide. Yeah. I'm, I'm not going to try to copy the Facebook for your attention. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, it would be nice to have, like, a video camera. <laughs> The videos are there just so that you can go back to the explanations if you, if you forget something. You know, I think that's, that's the main purpose. <laughs> so maybe I should have said that uh, you know, when I said, okay, you don't need to come to the class if you don't mind. <laughs> it's still our thing. They're going to watch all the videos, maybe a few days before the exam. <laughs> and of course, nothing will make sense. You know. and it's kind of dull if you think about it. You can just uh, watch the video for. More than an hour, I could do it. A lot of people dropped the class? Um, by the last count, there are still 37. So no one has dropped in the last one week or so. They're doing homework. Seriously, that's what they're doing. They're staying home to do homework. They're probably watching the videos and stuff. Doing the homework. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. I watch the videos if I miss class. Yeah, I watch the videos if I make an extra slide. But isn't it kind of dull? Uh, I'm used to it because I, I like, uh, I don't know, it's, I like seeing the picture and then hearing the sounds. Yeah, yeah. Like if I see the teacher, then I think of my class, and no one wants to be in class. <laughs> <laughs> The homeworks have been a little bit intense for some of you, I know. Uh, but uh, that's partly because some of you had limited C programming experience. And also some of you had limited programming experience. For example, I think a lot of you had done you know, Java and things like that. But, uh, just getting familiar with the Unix environment or Linux environment and doing C programming, that, that was a little bit uh, tough in the beginning. But uh, I think much more manageable. So, yeah. so how much effort was it after you've done HTTP client to do HTTP server? Not much. It wasn't, it wasn't a whole lot, right? I, it was, uh, we did uh, the concept, like, behind it to send it to see, so just modifying it to play right. the header to the board. Yeah. Well, I'm just waiting until 10 in the evening on Wednesday to start on it, so. <laughs> <laughs> so I turned it in, like, at 5 in the morning, so yeah. I was lazy. This took a while to get used to a C. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So, TCP has been around for a long time. We're starting the 70s, late 70s. And we already appreciate some of the problems that we might run into. If we have a very straightforward, reliable transport that we've been talking about, Right? Because we need to be very careful about how much data we can and we are allowed to send at a given time. That really goes to the crux of the problem. And it turns out it's a very difficult problem. People are still working on it today. So at various times, people have predicted that there will be a congestion collapse in the Internet. And that has to do with the way TCP worked back then, which is just use the flow control. And if we just use flow control, we're not really taking into account how much or how many bits the network can move at a given time. We're just worried about how many packets the receiver is able to receive at a given time. So we need to take both into account. So if you want to do 
congestion control using TCP, here are the three key challenges. Determining the level of resource that the receiver had for flow control, was it hard or easy? So for flow control, what's the example of resource that we talked about? What's the resource? It's the receiver buffer, right? How did we determine the available resource at a given time? The receiver told us. Yeah, but how did the receiver determine that? It's a simple arithmetic, right? Saying, okay, this is the maximum amount of memory I have. This is the number of packages that are outstanding that I haven't sent to the client yet. It's very simple, right? What's the resource when we're talking about the network? A little bit more complicated. It's not just uh, simple arithmetic on the memory. Talking about network links, talking about uh, routers and their buffers in between. Just like in flow control, to be able to send at the right rate without overwhelming or underwhelming the receiver, we had to determine okay, this is the amount of packets we can pump into the network. If we want to now take into account the network capacity, we need to determine, okay, how much capacity does the network have? The other complicating factor here is the network capacity, or available capacity, as it says on the slide, it changes often. When we're talking about flow control, the total amount of memory that we allocated for receive buffer, that pretty much does not change. When you boot up the system or when you configure the system, you're going to say, I'm going to al allocate 16 megabytes for receive buffer. That's it. The only calculation that you have to do in between is, okay, out of this 16 megabytes, how many megabytes are already occupied by outstanding packets? That's all you need to do. But how about in the network? It's under control by so many parties when your packets are transiting across the internet. The capacity itself is going to change dramatically. For example, if you have a construction crew that's digging the street, it's going to change the capacity, right? Because it might go down to zero. Or the routes that the packets take might change dynamically depending on various uh, conditions that the ISPs have put in place in what is most cost effective for them at a given time. And finally, we really need to start talking about how to share the network resource effectively. So even though one flow determines that, okay, the available capacity is 10 megabits per second, does not mean that one flow should use the entire capacity. So how can we have independent flows share the capacity? Turns out that's a, that's a difficult challenge. And here are the key ideas that solve that problem. Each source has to determine the network capacity for itself, because these are uncoordinated clients. Right? We have one server and you know, multiple clients you know, run from multiple hosts, multiple users. They're not going to coordinate with each other saying, OK, so the network capacity is 10 megabits per second, and then do some negotiation and say, OK, you use 5 megabits, I'm going to use 5 megabits. That's not how the internet works. Each client has to independently determine their rate. right? And the rate is, again, communicated using window size that we talked about. And there are different types of feedbacks. We're going to talk about that. Because a lot of times, you're going to make a mistake when you estimate. So we already talked about flow control window. But TCP, it turns out, it uses another window called congestion window. And the number of packets that's in transit is the minimum of these two windows. So we haven't talked about how TCP determines congestion window. We're going to talk about that. But let's just, uh, for now, let's understand that uh, similar to what we said about flow control, there is a window that determines you know, what is the maximum the receiver is able to receive at a given time. 
Similarly, there is some uh, calculation that happens that determines what is the congestion window that tells you what is the maximum the network is able to process at a given time. And what, what we mean by network is able to process is move the number of bits at a given time. So why should you use the minimum of the two? Why not maximum of the two? Because the whole concept is to share the resources equally. And mm -hmm. you don't want to, uh, if you take the max, you're still going to be outside one of the windows, mm -hmm. which will inevitably slow everything down because on the receiver end you'll be waiting too long or yeah. there's too much network congestion which brings your window too far down just causes more problems. Okay, so just to just to make that discussion more concrete, let's say flow control window is ten packets at a given time. What does that mean? The receiver is able to receive ten packets, right? So let's say the congestion window is Seven packets. What does that mean? Seven packets in flight. So how many packets should we send? Uh, Why? Why not ten? The receiver is able to handle ten. Okay. <laughs> so how about if congestion window, or the, let's call it network window, just to maybe maybe even generalize that. Network window is ten. And receiver window is five. How many should we send? Five. five. That, that's the reason we want to use the minimum of the two. Okay. How do you calculate the sending rate? So window is basically ten packets or something like that. That that is how many packets you're going to send in one round trip time, right? If I asked you, so what is the effective rate per second? That is how you're going to calculate that. It's pretty straightforward, right? So whenever we say, you know, window is 10 packets or 10 bytes, we're talking about you're allowed to send that many per round trip. Now, why do we always talk about a round trip? We need to receive an ACK, too, right? For a lot of this flow control and congestion control to work. So the key challenge is to determine what the congestion window is. And one of the things that's especially challenging is to adapt it depending on the network condition. So there are two mechanisms we're going to talk about. What happens, uh, you know, how do you set these windows when you start up TCP, when you start a new connection? And what do you do at a, at a stable state? We won't, we won't have time to get to the second part, but let's uh, at least uh, finish the first part, which is you've initiated a connection with, uh, uh, with let's say, you have, we have a client, we have a server, now, how many packets should the client send to the server in the beginning? Any ideas? Receiver window is 10. The receiver even says, okay, I have 10 megabytes of buffer. Send it to me. What should the client do? So the, the challenge here is we, we still don't know what the congestion window is. We still don't know the network capacity. We know the receiver can receive and buffer you know, 10 megabytes. So we take a very conservative approach, which is we send small amounts of data in the beginning just to see if the network can handle that packet. That's the key idea. But before we get there, we already understand what this line says, which is, you know, once you determine what the window is, you just send that whole window full of packets, right? Why do you take a conservative approach? Why, why, why do we take a conservative? Yeah, so uh, we, we'll get to that in just a moment. But let's just see what happens if we just use the flow control window. The receiver says, you know, 10 megabytes. And actually, it's worth taking a minute uh, just learning how to read these graphs. We haven't seen these kind of graphs before. So on x-axis, we have send time. And on y-axis, we have packet sequence numbers. So why does the line go up? Let's start near 0. Why does the line go up? Because we're sending more and more packets as time goes on. Right? 
Is that clear to everyone? OK. Then why does the line go down before two seconds? Yeah, it, it wasn't acknowledged, and you have to retransmit that, right? And it goes up again, because we're sending the whole receive window worth of packets, then it goes down. So what's the problem with uh, this type of packet pacing? You send it too many packets, and you can't handle it. So you're having to resend. Yeah. So that's one problem, definitely. The only reason why these packets are dropping is because we're sending too many. Actually, this diagram tells us another even more serious problem with this kind of approach. We're not spreading our packets out. We're sending them in big lumps. There, there's yet another. There's yet another. It's kind of uh, you really need to be trained to look for those things. Think about what's happening between you know, roughly one and a half seconds and two and a half seconds. What's happening? in the network? Nothing. Well, we sent one packet. We sent it, but we're still waiting to hear back. Yeah, I know, but we sent one packet. Is that good or bad? We were not using the network. Completely idle for a whole second. Does everyone see that? Yeah. So that's kind of the problem. So how do we set the window initially? We start small, as we said earlier. We start with one. Let's just call it one packet, just to simplify the discussion. And we increase it slowly. We send one packet, we receive an acknowledgment, and we say, OK, the network was uh, able to perfectly handle that. So we send two packets. And uh, next time, we send four packets. It may be too slow on fast network. I think this is what you were suggesting, saying uh, if the network capacity is 10 gigabits per second, how long is it going to take? By the way, I expect you to do these kind of calculations you know, for the exam, because you know, this is high school level arithmetic, right? <laughs> but it's going to take a long time. Do, do we agree? Because we started one packet, and then another round trip, we sent two packets. Another round trip, we sent four packets. So it's called slow start, that particular mechanism. But it's actually quite fast, if you think about it. How fast are we increasing the rate? We're actually doubling it every round trip time. Even though it seems sort of small, going from one packet to two to four, we're actually doubling it. So it's actually not as slow as it seems. And if you use this mechanism, so the earlier mechanism sent an entire window full of packets at a time, but now we're sending you know, one packet and then two packets and four packets and so forth. So if you use that mechanism, this is what the diagram becomes. So what have we improved here? What's the big improvement here? We're using the network continuously. There is no significant idle time in the network compared to this. Let's see, how the, does it, when it hits congestion, let's say the network speed is 10 gigabits, right? So you send, OK, let's send. 10.1? Uh, no, let's say, let's say you send 5, uh -huh. then you send 10. You double it, you send 10, you hit congestion. Yeah. So you, mm -hmm. you realize that you should stop at 5, or what do you do? Like, so the question. You, you, still have, you still have the limit. You can yeah. go up to 9. Right. Then, but so the question double, was. Mm -hmm. At some point, you're going to hit the network limit. So let's say the network is 10 gigabits per second. So we go from uh, you know, 2.5 to 5. Next time, we're going to double it to 10. So the question is, what happens next? And we're going to talk about that in the next lecture.